Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And it's great to be back on here, seeing you all in the comments section popping up, and to once again see my great friend, Pete Carmichael, Director of the Civil War Institute at Gaysburg College. Good evening, Pete. Hello, John. Uh, John and I are both a little weary from our Saturday extravaganza. With, we had Michael, we had two interviews in the morning. And then we had our two and a half hour to three hour battlefield tour. All of it uh, was really good. Um, it was, Michael, uh, kind of a salute to the CWI conference, which would have been, well, it would have been ongoing tonight, would have been uh, the end of the first day of tours. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow would have, uh, would have been the last. So uh, Michael is a veteran of CWI. I believe you were at CWI last summer mm -hmm. on the panel on the political crisis of the 1850s, I believe. That's right. Um, and Rachel Sheldon was on that. Uh, Michael Berkner of Gettysburg. And I am Nicole, Nicole, Nicole from Ball State University. Um, oh my gosh, Nicole's last name is? Etchison. Etchison, that's right. She was on an excellent, mm -hmm. excellent panel. Uh, so, um, Michael, we're, we're thrilled to have you uh, here this evening uh, to talk about your new book, Arguing until doomsday. Uh, Michael, I believe I told you this by email. Um, UNC books are, receive a 40% discount for our viewers. Uh, the press has been kind enough, uh, and John has just put it up the discount code, uh, which is uh, just below us. So, uh, for those of you who are interested in Michael's book, uh, I can tell you Amazon can't beat this price. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, there it is, and we'll put this back up as well. I want to say a little bit about Michael, who was at Marshall University um, for all, really your entire career until um, this year when Michael has received, or I should say accepted, a position at the University of Tennessee. He'll be in the faculty history department as an associate pro uh, professor. But uh, his, I want to say main line of work, but certainly an important duty is the editorship of the Andrew Jackson Papers. And so before we talk about that, because I want to ask Michael about the Andrew Jackson Papers, I, I just want to say that I, I feel old saying this, and I've known Michael for a while, but I see Michael as a generation of historians uh, just below me, I guess. And uh, Michael's work, it is always grounded in original research he is a person that gets out there into the archives. His methodology that he employs as I think always creative. He works in material culture. He also does uh, the history of emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, his first book, uh, Emotional and Sexual Conflicts in the Antebellum United States and published by Cambridge. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy of it right at my disposal. I believe that's right upstairs. I'll say it again, Emotional and Sexual Conflict in the antebellum United States. Again, it brings that dimension, Michael, we've talked a little bit about this uh, with our audiences, that dimension of emotions or emotives and how um, that world, when it is not fully considered, it sort of reduces people, I believe, um, to people who are just concerned about power for power's sake. And that's a pretty impoverished view, I think, of how anyone, but especially historical actors, how they behave. It's an outstanding book and it is one that was done under the guidance of Mark Smith. Um, like we've mentioned Mark Smith at the University of South Carolina. We had, I believe, uh, Evan Kutzler was, was he at grad school at the same time you were? Yeah, yeah we overlapped for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Evan was on the show as well, both trained by uh, by Mark Smith. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, Mark noted for doing sensory history and emotional history as well. Michael's done a range of other things, and I won't go through his very long um, resume. But I, I do want to mention, it's a fantastic piece entitled Tracing the Sacred Relics, The Strange Career of Preston Brooks's Cain. Right? It's a fascinating story. And Michael, of course, not being the diligent historian that you are, I do not have the citation quick at hand. Uh, and that, where could someone find that? What journal? Uh, Civil War History. In, uh, June 2017. Look at that, right? And a special issue devoted to what academics call material culture, what I think the public would say 
are relics or artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, a journal well worth uh, uh, perusing. Michael's article, Tracing the Sacred Relics, The Strange Career of the Cane of Preston Brooks. Do we know where the cane really is? Are you convinced we know where it is? What do you think, Michael? Where is it? Um, we, we know that it's probably at the Old State House Museum uh, in Boston. In Boston? What? Mm. It should be in South Carolina, shouldn't it? Well, there's pieces of it in, in South Carolina, um, in, the, in the South Carolina State Museum, um, mm. fragments that were uh, fashioned into jewelry and given as gifts yeah. uh, shortly after the, uh, the incident in 1856. But um, yeah, kind of a strange turn of events. Uh, took the, the main piece of the cane, um, handed down through a few generations of, of Henry Wise's family, who's Virginia. probably best known for being the governor of Virginia, who uh, oversaw the hanging of, of John Brown. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the 1920s ended up in, in Boston. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's interesting, Pete, that, that you, you said it should be in South Carolina because what we remember is the, the caning of Charles Sumner, right? right. Not the caning by Preston Brooks. Uh, so I, I suppose one could make the argument that Massachusetts is the, is the right, right for resting place. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Mike, one other point about the article I found fascinating. Uh, you know, we look at um, the petty partisanship and bickering. Uh, it's always been part of our system, but for whatever reason, people think it's uh, more acute now than ever before. Um, but I was struck by the debates over the, not the composition of the cane, I guess, or, or what the cane was made over. And, and why were people fighting about that? Would you mind telling folks about that? I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, there was a whole congressional investigation into the, the densities and the, the weights and the resilience uh, of different kinds of canes, whether they were made of wood uh, or, or in the case of the cane that, that Preston Brooks used in, in the attack on, on Charles Sumner, uh, gutta percha, which is uh, extracted from uh, kind of a, a sap-like substance from a tree. And uh, I, I think what was at stake there in, in some sense is just how much danger was Charles Sumner actually in, um, you know, how flimsy uh, was this weapon or how, how dangerous was it? And I mean, I, there was a physician who, who testified and said, look, if, if you hit someone in the head with any kind of a cane enough times, it's, it's going to be dangerous <laughs> at, at a certain point. So the, the debate probably went a little bit more into depth than it needed to. Uh, I guess the southern response was that gutta percha was a, uh, was a soft material and that, and that Sumner just had a, a, a feeble cranium, right? Right, or that he was faking. Uh, he was faking. Of his injuries. Um, I mean, he, he, was, he stayed out of the Senate for three years um, yeah. after the fact, and, yeah. and so there were some who, who claimed that he was. Yeah. Just, just, him. just calling in sick, right? Just to get a few days off, and it turned out to be three years, right? Before he knew it, three right. years ago. Right? <laughs> One of my friends, Keith Bohannon, who uh, Michael knows, and, and uh, John knows as well, who's up in at CWI, he met one of Preston Brooks's descendants, and I believe maybe in Tennessee, I'm not sure where, but she had a number of the canes that um, Preston Brooks's admirers sent what? and mm -hmm. she, she had a number of them, and she took one, according to Keith, and tapped herself on the head, tapped, and said, see, this doesn't hurt anyone. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful story. I don't know what anyone <laughs> To make anything of it or not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, again, I just want to say the kind of work that Michael does, it's always worth reading. It's always very thoughtful. And he did another piece, and I think this is going to lead us into uh, our conversation about his book today. It's a piece that he did for the blog that accompanies the Society of Civil War Historians, again, an organization that John and I have mentioned a number of times. Uh, if you go to the blog, which does have a name, and I don't remember, it's not The Courier. Do you know what the name of the blog is? Uh, muster. The Muster, that is it, The Muster. Right, and I think this piece that Michael did on the mud sills, that idea, I think our audience, one needs to know what that, what is meant by calling someone a mud sill. How did it originate? And then how did that word, in a sense, function, right, um, as 
a political weapon. It's weaponized, right? Southerners try to weaponize it, and then Northerners do as well. And I think because language is really important here when we try to understand uh, politics. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And again, for those of you who are listening, go to the muster, right? Mm -hmm. So type in the muster, type in Michael Woods, and you'll see the entire piece. But Michael's going to tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about Mudsills, right? And then we'll slide into a discussion of his book. Yeah, so the, the term gets popularized in a uh, speech given in the Senate by James Henry Hammond, who was a South Carolina senator um, in 1858, who um, opined that every society needs a, a class of, of people who do menial labor, people who work uh, with their hands. Um, and, and he called these folks mudsills. And he said, you know, in, in the South, we have enslaved um, this, this, this class or this sort of uh, level of, of society, and that's given us order and stability. Um, and in the North, you have this class too, um, but you've, you know, you've made the great mistake of allowing these folks to vote, um, giving them too much power, and, and, and hence your, your society is, is disorderly uh, and, and, and prone to, to collapse. Um, the the Mudsill speech became overnight news uh, across the, the, the free states. I mean, you have people organizing Mudsill clubs, um, and, and a lot of working people in the North, obviously they're outraged. Um, by this, you know, to, to be sort of written off as this kind of degraded uh, level of, of society, but they also kind of reclaim the term um, and, and, and turn it into a, a badge of honor, um, you know, that, that we're people with, with the know-how and the skill, um, and, you know, our labor makes, um, you know, the economy function. Um, and so uh, it becomes uh, weaponized, I think is a good term, um, when the Civil War begins a few years later. Um, and you see appeals to mudsills used in union uh, recruiting literature. Um, you see it used uh, in Republican campaign literature. Um, uh, the Lincoln campaign uses this in 1860. Um, and so it, it, it takes on a kind of a life of its own. And, and one of the things that, that a lot of people recognized at the time was that this was something that would get white Northerners who may not care very much about enslaved people uh, in the South. This would give them a sense that, you know, that, that, that Southern aristocracy, what they would call the slave power, really didn't like them. Uh, really didn't respect them. Um, really, kind of wanted to lord it over uh, the whole the whole country, and it would give them a sense of having something at stake um, in in the fight. That the dignity of labor um, and of free labor was essential. Um, so, if you look at this term, it shows up in soldiers' diaries. Um, you know, they'll celebrate victories. They'll say, "Oh, the mud sills of the North just right. beat the, the chivalry of the South." Right. Um, and then it comes up uh, big time in, uh, in 1865 when Sherman is, is moving through uh, South Carolina and his soldiers just start, start torching all of the, the big homes uh, that they, they can find. Um, because as they said, you know, they've, they've been waiting for revenge on South Carolina in, in particular. Yeah. And, and that mudsill speech has, has a lot to do with it. it. Resonated with them. Yeah. When I was a reenactor back in the day uh, in Indiana, the organization that I belonged to, you know, as a hodgepodge of various union groups, we were called the Mud Sills. Mm -hmm. Again, I, we didn't know any of that context, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's especially important for the war years. Mm -hmm. As you just pointed out, Sherman's men increasingly uh, came to see that the system of slavery, that it's uh, what they believe, what they believe, was that the real victim was the poor white. That's what they believed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see how um, yeah, that what slavery, if expanded into the territories, uh, what that could do for other white men and how that could relegate them in society, which we're going to get to. I want to get to one other point about that article, Michael, that I thought you did it. I, I thought it was an apt comparison. You made an analogy to Trump's election and against Hillary Clinton and... And could you just talk a little bit, just briefly, about that? How that connects to Mudsill? I I don't. <laughs> you're going to have to jog my memory on that one, Pete. So what did Hillary Clinton called Trump supporters? What did she call them? 
Oh, well, she, she used the term deplorables. Deplorables, right? There. And in yeah. piece, you make the point, right? How that word, how it came to be what? It became a rallying cry for many of Trump supporters and was certainly more than dismissive, in which I suspect that she immediately went into <laughs> that word's back, right, mm -hmm. when she said it. But as we can see, right, it became something that helped unify people who supported Trump and helped identify them as, I would say, we are not part of that elite class, that political class that supports or that supported uh, Hillary Clinton. I bring that up because one, I think that 19th century historians, really like all historians, they very much want to be relevant. They want to connect to contemporary issues. And I've seen time and time again, the attempt to do so it is such a stretch and such a strain that it often removes us from the history itself. And, and we lose sight of what is one of the many gifts that I think the craft of history brings to the public. That's the importance of context, right? Being time and place specific. Mm -hmm. And so this stretching, this reaching, this almost desperation to be relevant. Um, yeah, I think it doesn't do a, a great deal of service, not just for our profession, but for the people who we want to have give them an opportunity to think, you know, more deeply and more complex terms. I think that quick analogy that you made and that you forgot, but I thought it was a really good one, right? Because you weren't leveling any value judgments at all, right? You were making an important comparison. I think there's parallels between the past and today. Uh, I don't know how you or John feel about whether, you know, the history recycles itself or that somehow some way that we sort of can see the future if we know the past. I, I don't believe in any of that. Now, people do, and that's, of course, their business. Uh, but uh, I really like that piece. I like how you made history relevant, and you did so without abandoning that, what Metzels was about, how it was used politically by Southerners and by Northerners as well. Mm -hmm. So let's now turn to the book. John, would you like to get us started? Or I'm happy to get us go out of the gate here, whatever you like. Well, I'd like to pose a question, Michael, uh, if you would, that's really one that we get in every single series, it seems like, from the people in the comment section who watch us weekly. And they always want to know uh, two things, which is uh, why the why the antebellum period in this case? Why was this the direction you wanted to go with your work? And second... Uh, what kind of a research method did you use to utilize your work in this book? Mm -hmm. um, I don't really remember a time when I wasn't interested um, in the antebellum period. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, in, in some ways, this book is a, an outgrowth of the research that I did uh, for my first book. Um, there were things that I found in the archives that, that intrigued me um, and that I, I, I didn't think could be explained by other work that I had read. And I, I can go into more detail on that if, if you like, but um, so that it, it sort of, there's a, tra a trajectory to the, to the work that I've done um, where they all, they connect to each other. Um, as far as research method, um, I mean, the, the important thing for me, um, and Pete alluded to this, uh, was to dig into the archives and especially into uh, constituent correspondence, which uh, I think is invaluable for understanding politics because it tells you, and especially in this period where there's there's no public opinion polls, there's no, um, you know, kind of instant way to gauge public sentiment. Um, those kinds of reports coming in from, from back home to major politicians like Stephen Douglas and Jefferson Davis are invaluable. And so fortunately, both of these uh, men left vast uh, collections of, of manuscript material. Um, it took me seven weeks to, to read through Douglas's uh, correspondence at the University of Chicago. Um, Davis's papers are a bit more scattered, but, um, but there's, there's rich collections in several different archives. And so um, that, that was really at the, at the heart of it, was understanding what did they know uh, about how their actions were being received by constituents, and then how did their... Uh, constituents and, and the folks back in their home states of, of Illinois and Mississippi, how did they evaluate 
how did they see these these two figures um, and, and how did their pressure help to ultimately to drive them apart and to splinter their party so um, it's it's definitely rooted in in the archives and and in uh, in some really rich material that probably hasn't especially for Douglas hasn't gotten as much attention as it as it deserves you know Michael I'm somewhat embarrassed as I was you know reading your book and I thought to myself why is it that I've always thought of almost all antebellum politicians is essentially disconnected from their constituents. Why didn't I ever think about the fact that people are writing them and pressuring them and making demands upon them that the local and the state level, right? that mm -hmm. it mattered right? and the decisions that they're making in Congress? Well, of course it's a reflection of the people back home. I, I can't get my students to understand when they denounce the political class that we have today, that that political class is a reflection of them. And, and I have students, again, I'm not trying to be political one way or the other. I'm just stating a fact. People, students will say to me, how is it that certain members of the Republican Party continue to abide by Trump when he's done this, this, and this? And I say to them, because the people in their constituency, in their district, or in their state are Trump supporters. Right? You can't expect a politician to jump off the ship right, when he's got those people uh, who are, are behind him. So... I, I, we're going to get back to that. Michael, I think one thing for our viewers that would be helpful, and I, I don't need to go into great detail here, but could you broadly uh, frame some of the theories about the coming of the Civil War? I'd like to understand that briefly. Yeah. And then I'd like for you to situate your book, situate that within these broad theories or approaches to understanding the coming of the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a pretty fundamental split um, between the, the so-called fundamentalists who would argue that there's just these deep-rooted social, political, economic um, distinctions between um, two societies in the United States that, that go to war. Um, and in that case, maybe something about the timing of the war uh, might be uh, up for kind of... Um, you know, uh, a bit of contingency, but that basically this war was going to happen in some in some form. Um, and then you have those who who emphasize contingency, who argue that you know this is a product of human decisions um, or human foibles. Um, that that you know none none of this was foreordained in any way, um, and that if we really dig in and, and look at how people make decisions, um, how they think about things the accidents uh, of history, um, you know, that, that, that things could have been really different um, in, a, in a really basic way. Um, in, in some sense, I've always been, and this goes back to my first book, I, I've been trying to, 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 to reconcile those, or maybe, maybe not to completely bridge the gap between them, but to, to try to draw insights uh, from both. And so um, I, I probably lean a, a bit more toward the, toward the fundamental um, side. But I think that um, one of the advantages of a book like Arguing Until Doomsday is that that biographical, or in this case, a dual biographical approach, really lets us understand how real people lived and navigated this increasingly divided and, for, for both of them, often very frightening um, political landscape. Um, and so it, it isn't it isn't that that you know, that, that they were, um, you know, that they were members of a, of a generation that blundered its way uh, into war. Um, and, and I mean, one of the points of the book is that we can't understand either one without situating them in their, in their home, home states and, in, and in what's happening there. Um, but they still made decisions. Um, they still made mistakes. They still misunderstood certain things. And, and so um, I, I suppose it would be ultimately an effort to humanize that uh, kind of fundamental uh, view of the coming of the war by looking at how two actual people saw things. And two uh, actual people who were very prominent in the Democratic Party. Yeah. Well, let's do a little background again, and then we'll start to get into like the nature of, of your argument. I think again, Michael, I don't know if you'd agree with me about this and, and John, but I, it, it strikes me at the college level when the Civil War is taught that too often, we skim the politics of the 1850s, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, but they don't, it doesn't receive maybe the attention that it deserves. So can you give us 
very quickly. We get to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. We don't need to know the background of that act, but we need to know what it did to the two-party system and what came out of it and why the Democratic Party, right, a national party, it persevered. So could you help our audience understand that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, 1854, is is a huge, hugely important milestone. I mean, I, I tell my students it's one of the most important pieces of legislation in the history of the United States. Um, it, uh, it, it it opens uh, two new territories of, of Kansas and Nebraska, which are much larger than the modern day states. I mean, it's basically the northern two thirds of the, the Great Plains um, are, are encompassed here. Um, these are areas that had been closed uh, to the possibility of slavery expansion um, since 1820, um, but now it is, it is possible um, thanks to the, the, the policy of popular sovereignty um, by which uh, voters in each of these territories in some way, and that's kind of the, the crux of the debate, um, will have the opportunity to, to weigh in on whether slavery will be legal there or not. It's passed as a Democratic Party measure. Uh, Stephen Douglas is a uh, real kind of force behind um, the, the, the passage of the legislation. Uh, President Franklin Pierce made it um, somewhat reluctantly, but, but made it a, a party measure. Um, and it, it proves profoundly disruptive in a couple of ways. Um, it's this law that really brings uh, the Republican Party into being. Um, I mean, it is, it is essentially um, born as a response to uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And uh, it, 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 um, you know, this is the party that will, will call for free soil um, in, all, in all Western territories and say there will be an end to slavery expansion. Um, and of course, it's the, the victory of that party in 1860 that's the kind of immediate uh, trigger for, for secession. But it's also profoundly disruptive within the Democratic Party. Um, and that is because there is a very, very deep rooted difference um, between predominantly, although not entirely, a, a northern wing of the party and a predominantly southern wing of the party uh, about what exactly popular sovereignty means, how it should work, um, and really what the extent of popular majority control ought to be over slavery status um, in, in the territories. And that is a dispute that I think gets glossed over, not just in history textbooks, but in a lot of, of deeper uh, studies of, of the coming of the war. And so bringing that to the forefront, I think is the only way to explain what happened to the Democratic Party in 1860, which is it fragments and they run two competing candidates, uh, one of whom was Douglas. Um, and, and essentially, you know, you see the last um, national political party uh, fracture in those six years between 1854 and, and 1860. And that's really the heart of the book. It, it is, although there's some important background here, and then I'll ask my question here and then we'll throw it over to John. Let's talk about, about Davis and about Douglas. And I just want to say that what makes this such a fascinating book is that it is a dual biography. It's not a traditional biography in any way. And what you do so well is that you situate both of these men uh, from their journeys, one to Illinois, of course, and the other to Mississippi. Could you talk to us about those experiences and how it shaped, this is the critical part, how it shaped their visions mm -hmm. of the West and mm -hmm. then Destiny. I think that's really critical. It is. So they both are born further east than they end up. I mean, uh, Davis is born in Kentucky. Uh, Douglas is born in Vermont. Um, they both move west um, and made their careers in the Mississippi River Valley, which is a hugely important you know, real geographic space, but also important in the way that a lot of antebellum Americans envisioned the country, that this is kind of the heart of what will become uh, a, a continent-wide uh, republic. And so they both are, I think, deeply shaped by very formative experiences in two states that are in this in the same river valley. And so Douglas um, really embraces a kind of a, a booster uh, view of, of the West, that it'll be driven by railroads and urban development and um, uh, crops like wheat and lumber, um, and that if you if you kind of give people a stable um, set of political institutions and you build a bunch of infrastructure and you can just kind of stand back and and, and allow 
um, this, this, this kind of empire uh, to grow. And so I see him as, as trying to extend what I call in the book, the greater Northwest with Chicago really as its, its kind of commercial capital all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Um, I come from the Pacific Northwest, so perhaps I'm more attuned uh, yeah. to, to Douglas's thinking about this, but, but he's really focused on, um, you know, kind of this Great Lakes to Puget Sound kind of, kind of region um, is, is very near and dear to him. This would be a very, a very decentralized uh, kind of place. It would, you'd have a series of kind of self-governing states and territories, essentially. Uh, you kind of just turn folks loose uh, in these areas. Davis has a different vision. He's, he's equally committed to westward expansion um, as, as, as Douglas is, and there are certainly moments where they, they um, align very closely. They both are eager supporters of the annexation of Texas, eager supporters of the war with Mexico. Um, so they aren't arguing all the time, um, but they argue an awful lot of the time. And um, one of the things where, where they just fundamentally disagree is on how are you going to combine uh, expansion with uh, the, the fact that, that you already are having these disputes about slavery. And what Douglas envisions is a much more, ultimately, a, a much more centralized kind of expansion where federal power, the courts, the military, law enforcement will support the property rights of slaveholders throughout the West, uh, potentially in any territory. And that's given some uh, uh, judicial weight uh, with the, the Dred Scott decision in 1857, uh, which is in, in the short run a major victory for Davis's vision uh, of what the West should look like. Um, and so he's, he's envisioning slave labor being exploited in California, uh, in gold mines, in irrigated, irrigated agriculture. He's envisioning this happening in New Mexico. Um, and crucially, he's hearing from people on the ground who share that vision, who say, yeah, this is possible. You know, there's, there's not a natural limit to where slavery could go. If, 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 if it's supported um, and protected, then there's, there's really no limit to this. And, and so that's, that's, that's the vision that he has. Um, and it, it's fundamentally at odds with, with what Douglas is trying to do. Yeah. I think your chapter title is, is it Manifest Destinies? Plural? Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Different views. Um, nice. Just real quickly about Douglas. I could see someone reading this book or just hearing you now and making the conclusion that though Douglas as a Democrat, he was reflective of this conviction amongst Northerners that government at the federal level should have a decisive role in the lives of the people that government, not necessarily more centralized, because as you point out, he still believed that the people on the ground in the territories, that they can make their way in this world, including deciding on their political institutions. But nonetheless, there is still a desire for uh, federal support, extensive federal support for harbors, for railroads, for all the kinds of things, as you pointed out, Michael, to build that infrastructure. Is someone's interpretation, the one that I just gave you, is that misguided? Is that off the mark? Um, you see my point, right? I do. Yeah, right? It's the Northerners who wanted the big government and it's the Southerners who wanted small government and there's where the rub was. How would you respond to that? Uh, I would say they wanted government to do different things. Um, I mean, D Davis is a sharp critic of the kind of infrastructure program that, uh, that Douglas is, is, is promoting um, for, as you mentioned, harbor improvements, building railroads, building canals, um, supporting these things. Um, he's a sharp critic of that, but at the same time, he, he wants a vigorous use of, of federal uh, power uh, to protect slavery everywhere that it exists or might exist. Um, and, and, you know, D Douglas is, is much more comfortable with, with the infrastructure, and he says, now, you know, there, there's limits to how much we're going to nationally uh, support, uh, you know, the, the property rights of a, of a slaveholder in, in, you know, New Mexico territory or in, in Kansas territory. So, um, they, they, they both are um, interested in, in controlling the levers of, of federal power, but they want to use it in very different ways. Um, one of the interesting things, too, about Douglas is 
how much of that famous um, Republican Party economic program that we see enacted during the war, how much of that Douglas actually supported? Um, and that was one of the things that surprised me as I was researching this project. The one that he wouldn't embrace was uh, an increased tariff. Um, but beyond that, you know, infrastructure, um, support for higher education, he actually voted for a, a, a failed attempt at what would become the Land Grant Colleges Act uh, in 1859. Um, and so there, there's a variety of programs that he had been supporting, um, could never make them Democratic Party measures because the Southern wing of the party wouldn't go along with it. Um, and then the Republicans kind of take that and embrace it um, and, and, and make it their own, as, as uh, historians have shown. Mm -hmm. Michael, with uh, in the antebellum period, for for me personally and for others, uh, from a popular history standpoint, or even from uh, you know an academic standpoint, it seems like after the Lincoln Douglas debates, Douglas kind of drops off from the picture and the narrative. Did Douglas? Uh, rise in political power after that stay the same is he uh is he changed by that moment politically at all douglas became very embattled uh even more so after the debates with with lincoln in in 1858 so i mean in the short run he he was he won re-election i mean that was obviously the big thing for him was he was re-elected to the senate um but he, he comes under increasing attack in a variety of ways um, by Southerners within his own party, um, some of whom had actually hoped that Lincoln would beat him just because they hated him that much <laughs> and, and wanted to kind of decapitate him from the party's leadership. Uh, and John Slidell of, of Louisiana is out campaigning uh, right. for, for Lincoln and people are saying Lincoln will win. And he says, yeah, but you know, it's, it's worth it to get it Douglas. Yeah. But, uh, so he, he comes under attack. I mean, in, in early 1859, there's rumors that um, that people are uh, Southerners in the Senate are trying to provoke him into a duel, um, whereby he could be killed because he has no experience with this, um, and so they'll they'll get a you know kind of crack shot to to take him out in a, in a duel. Um, there but, are uh, Michael yeah. Douglas is so small; he's not much of a target. No, he was short, but 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 a wide target. He was wide, you're right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. 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 Um, he also, uh, you know, they, they strip him of his uh, chairmanship of the uh, Committee on Territories um, in the Senate, which was a real sort of basis for, for a lot of his power. He'd held that, that chairmanship for his entire uh, time in the Senate up until that point. So he's increasingly embattled. Um, he's writing a lot, which is always dangerous for an antebellum politician. The more letters and, and articles that you write, the you know the more people you might alienate. But but he just he can't help it. He's 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 too much of a, of a fighter not to. So he, he's coming. He's he's increasingly defensive um, in in 1859 um, and 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 in, in 60. And and then by the time he wins, sort of wins the uh, the party nomination for the presidency in 1860, it's it's at the cost of fracturing the party because uh, much of the southern uh, wing and, and and some of the northern elements of the party just won't won't support him and, and they they support uh, breckenridge um, as an alternative so he's he certainly hasn't lost any of his visibility um politically um but his his power within his party is is, is clearly weakened um and his ability to um, kind of command anything as a party measure is, is, is pretty much gone at that point. Hmm. Michael, it's, it's utterly mystifying to me that the Democratic Party couldn't get its act together, uh, especially after the election of 1856. I mean, Fremont has a very strong showing, hmm. and you probably know off the top of your head, but Republicans take a fair number of seats. I don't remember how many, but it's certainly pretty impressive for their first run. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's already the specter of a Republican Party that is going to become a dominating force at the federal level. And then John Brown's raid. For God's sake, couldn't they say, you know, we have an option here. It is us or the Republicans. And we know that they continue to describe condemn the Republicans as the black Republicans. And again, for our audience, you know, that is suggesting that any Republican was an abolitionist in disguise. So could you help us understand, because one of the big points about your book, and it's an important one, that if we are to understand why the war came, 
why secession, that we must grapple with the unraveling of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which I can say. I mean, I mention it, but I don't think about it, I think, with any real seriousness until I read your book. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here, man? Their political life is at stake. Obviously, the unity of the nation as well, and they did mm -hmm. seem to get it together. Why? Uh, there's a lot of big egos uh, with long memories um, in the in the picture, is what I would say. Um, I mean, one one of the points I make is that there there the roots of this division go way back um, into the into the early 1840s um, when Davis and, and Douglas are first starting out their national careers. So they have been sparring pretty seriously over a lot of these issues for a long time. Um, and they remember that. And there's a lot of bitterness that builds up over the years. Um, another thing that's going on is um, both factions of the party are saying we are the only ones who can actually beat the Republicans. So um, you have to rally around us. But there's also an increasing willingness to accept defeat at the polls as a means potentially of getting something else. So what you see among some, and this is not true of all, it's not true of Davis, for example, but there are elements of the Southern Democratic Party who actually would are fine with splitting the party because if a Republican wins, then they can push for secession, um, which they've been wanting to do for a long time. So this is people like Yancey, William Hans Yancey of Alabama um, would be an example of this. Red in South Carolina would be an example of this. They're, they're kind of Democrats, but they're, they're, they're really, they're secessionists is, is what they're at. So fracturing the party for them actually makes good strategic sense. Um, Davis is uncomfortable with this, but, um, but they're, they're there. On the other hand, the thing that I really noticed in a lot of the, the constituent letters to Douglas is an increasing willingness among Northern Democrats to say, we either want Douglas as our standard bearer in the election, and we hope he wins, we'll vote for him, we'll campaign for him. But if he doesn't, we'd rather see a Republican win than a Southern backed Democrat. They're the ones who are so worried about all these abolitionists. They're the ones who feel like they have a lot to lose. So if they're going to try to tell us who the nominee should be, forget it. Let them, um, you know, sort of stew under under Republican uh, presidency for four years. Yeah. So these folks clearly didn't think that, that secession was necessarily going to be automatic right. um, if, if a Republican won. But there's enough hostility within the party that, that they're they're actually willing to court defeat rather than give in to the other the other faction hmm. i i'm follows with another question and that is uh, we hear so often about the power of white supremacy and, and i think again this does have relevance to today because i think that what you've done in this book is you have forced us to think behind that banner of white supremacy to see complexities and how power relations are formed and how power is exerted. And so now my point or question. When we think of the Democratic Party after, especially after 1856, we think of a party that is united around the flag of it's a party for white men. It's a party for white men. And when one looks to the West and to those territories, that even though Southern slaveholders want to bring their institution to those lands, it's nonetheless, oh, this is battle cry as well. This is land for white folks, white people. And I guess again, what I want you to help us all understand, how is it possible that white solidarity which we again hear time and time again today, not just about what's been going on in the last 21 days since the murder of George Floyd, but that we hear time and time again, as we should look to our past, there is a singular fact, a truism, or one might even say a theme, and it is, again, white supremacy. So if it's so powerful, it's so strong, such a cohesive force, why didn't it hold the Democratic Party together? What's going on? Right. I mean, one, one of the points in, in my book is both, both Davis and, and Douglas are, are deeply racist. Um, and they're, they're, you just, I mean, there's no arguing with that. Right. Um, but they don't, they don't, they, they agree that, that the country should be governed for and by 
white men, but that doesn't mean they agree on how those white men should should rule or or what policies they should they should promote. Um, racists don't always agree with each other on everything. Or, or yes, or even who, which white men are entitled to rule. Yeah, or or what the extent of their rule should be. I mean, what what it comes down to is is a majority of white men going to rule, or are the property whites of a certain class of white men going to be sacrosanct and and above all all suspicion, all taint, all restriction. Um, and that, that's really the, the rub uh, of, of the argument between them. And so there are moments where you can see them kind of briefly rally, briefly regroup um, against abolitionists, for example, um, or, or against anyone who would, who would dare say that the, the Declaration of Independence um, applied to, to, to everybody as opposed to just white folks. And so it's there. Um, but it isn't as though these, these folks suddenly, suddenly became less racist in 1860, and that's why the party fell apart. It's just that there, there's other interests at stake here, and, and um, they, they, can't, they can't use that as, as a, a, a kind of a veil to hide their very real differences over policy forever. I mean, the historian Barbara Fields once pointed out that, that uh, white supremacy is a slogan, right, not a, a, a sort of single belief system. And, and I think you see that playing out um, in, in what's happening in Davis and Douglas's party, which is that the, the slogans, the scare tactics, they don't, they don't work forever once they actually have to govern. It can be useful sometimes for winning elections, but when they have to make policy decisions, suddenly the, those, those differences, which have been festering for many years, just burst forth and, and they just, they don't, they, don't, they don't hold together anymore. Yeah. Michael, we've mentioned Barbara Fields' piece a number of times on this show, and I, the races and ideologies in the, the book that is part of the, the tribute to C. Van Woodward, which is a very difficult book, article to read. Uh, I've just been looking at uh, the last few days. And then she did an, a similar piece. It's a little bit more accessible in the New Left Review. But even that um, has its places where it's really challenging. And all that is so unfortunate because what you just said, I think is something that we all uh, could stand a dose of and trying to understand the, uh, the issues that are confronting African-Americans, particularly those who live in, I'd say, is underserved neighborhoods. I think one of the other things that Barbara Fields points out that this idea that these issues or these problems are racial problems, how much that absolutely disguises. And I think that what you've just said about the Democratic Party and the very fact that so-called racial solidarity that we've always sort of slapped across the party as this is the slogan uh, to able to, uh, to enable them to mobilize people to vote in a uniform way. It's just not the case. I, I think it would serve as well. When I've heard so many people speak of Trump supporters as all white nationalists. Again, I suspect that there's some out there, but that kind of characterization is just far too simplistic. And again, I'm not making a judgment for or against just simply saying, uh, like Black Lives Matter. I mean, I think white is so amazing and revealing is how many white people now uh, are behind many of the issues uh, that was for a movement that a lot of white folks until recently uh, had not uh, had not signed on to. So, yeah, this book that you've done, I, I think it reminds us all, as you pointed out, to think very carefully what our slogans, how effective are those slogans, and to never sort of essentialize people as being this or that. And I think your book does a nice job. Yeah. Yeah. One, of the, one of the themes of, of the book that, that I, I tried to draw out was how anti-slavery folks um, who were very politically savvy, and then Lincoln is one of these, recognized these deep divisions um, within, within what to them was, was the opposition uh, party. And then they worked to inflame them. Uh, I mean, to, Lincoln very famously does this in the debates with Douglas, but you have folks doing it back in the 1840s as well, kind of forcing um, Democrats to hash out some of the, the issues on which they disagreed with each other. And so, um, you know, that kind of, those are the folks that, 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 that most historians tend to sympathize with. And, and I would um, just emphasize that they're, they're figures in this book too, that they're not just watching 
All right, their opponents fall apart. They're actively yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us real quickly how were the Republicans or Lincoln in particular? How were they? And I'm going to use the word reckless, right? Or how did they um, try to depict the other side in ways that uh, sort of uh, deranged people's understandings of what was really happening? Right? How how did they do that? Uh, well, I mean, one one of the things that, that that I think is interesting about Lincoln in particular is how his strategy shifts, um, even during the debates with Douglas. He he comes in and, and he, you know he expects to cast Douglas as this agent uh, of the slave power who's responsible for the Kansas Nebraska Act, but then he realizes pretty quickly that that doing that will will actually kind of potentially heal some of the breach uh, within the Democratic Party, and so he starts forcing. Uh, Douglas to talk about the potential uh, free soil implications of popular sovereignty. He starts to say, you know, are, are, are you really for building up uh, the slave interest or breaking it down? Um, he said Douglas was trying to pretend like he was doing both at the same time. Um, but, but just sort of not allowing him to... Um, to rely on, on slogans and, and, and to force them to say, okay, how do you think this is actually going to play out in places like Kansas? What's what's the outcome of all this going to be? Um, and 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 Douglas gets gets kind of caught there. Um, and and so I mean though that would be a, a moment where I think they're I, I wouldn't say they're distorting things, but but they're they're not allowing uh, the opposition to sort of um, debate on its own terms. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a couple fans of the Lincoln Douglas debate in the in the comment section, which is great because we never talk about <laughs> this. It seems like around the anniversary, we have like you, know, you see it on C-SPAN, and then it goes away, and we don't see it again for twenty years. Uh, but Richard Houston has a great question: uh, How much did the Freeport Doctrine hurt Douglas among Southerners, Michael? And and give a quick overview of what. Freeport Doctrine is because even I have to look that up to remember what that is. <laughs> so it refers to a, a statement that, that Douglas made during the, the debate at Freeport, Illinois, um, where he, he basically says that um, any uh, territorial government could simply refuse to pass laws protecting uh, slaveholders' property rights, um, and that that would, without formally banning slavery, that, but that depriving it of the legal apparatus that upheld slavery would be enough to keep slavery out of a territory. Now, for a long time, historians said this absolutely demolished uh, Douglas's standing uh, with the South. Then you have a, another kind of uh, reinterpretation which suggests Douglas had already said this before. It's not new uh, in 1858, um, so maybe it wasn't that decisive. But there's pretty clear evidence, um, and I, I mentioned this in the book, that they do remember Freeport um, going into the 1860 uh, presidential nomination um, and that, that, that really dramatic breakup of the party at their convention in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and there, there's a great account of uh, a couple of delegates uh, from Mississippi, actually, from, from Davis' state, who go in carrying copies of um, the, the the Lincoln Douglas debates with the Freeport Doctrine in there, and they say they're going to they're going to destroy him with it. So I think in the the Freeport uh, statement coming on the heels of uh, Douglas's uh, stand against admitting Kansas as a state under the Lecompton Constitution, those two things together do really undermine uh, much of of Douglas's support. Uh, within the South. It never goes away entirely, but if you look at the vote tallies, his, his support in, in the slave states is pretty weak. He gets something like 88% of his popular vote strength in, in the North. Mm. Wow. Do we have any other questions? Uh, uh, not right now, Pete. You can go ahead if you have one. I will, uh, I will uh, pass ahead here then. Um, so I, I'm still sort of grappling with Jefferson Davis's views, um, because he said, you know, these two issues that historians haven't fully appreciated, and that is, he said, property rights and this issue of, it's about majority rule, correct? Mm -hmm. So wh what I'm trying to figure out here is, can you help us understand how the, the, the slaveholder defense, which obviously is about 
there's the property, the right to own African Americans. It's the right to take that property that they own, chattel, and to take it into territory that they think that they have that they have a right to. Um, and then this issue of majority rule. What I guess I'm trying to sort of stumble toward, and I hope you can clarify it for me and for everybody else, is I'm trying to get beyond what you're suggesting, that to reduce this just to race is not even close to being satisfactory to understanding the complexity of their worldview. How does this uh, reservations that Davis has against majority rule and this commitment to property rights, how does that fit within a broader ideology that he and other slaveholders share? Right. So, I mean, his fundamental argument is that if 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 slaves are, are property uh, under the law, then a slaveholder ought to be able to take that property into any territory belonging to the United States and receive protection ultimately from the federal government for uh, the enjoyment of that property. Uh, so that might mean the ability to turn to the court system uh, to recover a, a, a fugitive um, or to um, you know, command a, a slave patrol, right, or any of the other kind of legal um, apparatus that's there to make slavery work. Um, you know, that it's already present in, in slave states, and he wants to extend this into, into territories. And where Douglas criticizes that is, is he says, well, that that you're offering much more protection to a slipholder than to the owner of any other kind of property. And Davis actually just flatly says, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, because, I mean, in, enslaved humans as, as property are more difficult to maintain as property. And, and Douglas or Davis says this on the floor of the Senate. He, he, he says it, this is a, a uniquely fragile uh, system of, of property rights. And so we need unique uh, protections um, as a result. Um, so yes, I am asking for uh, the federal government to go beyond what it does to the owner of a horse or a chair or any other kind of property. Um, and and I, I am demanding that um, in, in the territories. And, and Douglas says, no, it, it, it has to be subject to local majority control to decide how much protection they're willing to give you. And I think what's important about this is in all the scholarship on slavery, there's this real emphasis on the, the master-slave relationship, right? This kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship. Mm -hmm. But slavery required the active support of a much larger community of, of free people to make it work, to recover fugitives, to put down insurrections, right? To help to police this whole institution required often the active participation of a larger community. Mm -hmm. and Davis is essentially arguing for the right of a slaveholder to force a territorial community to participate. And Douglas is saying now uh, they have the right to, to say no to participating in that. Uh, to becoming, um, you know, kind of um, embedded in that if if a, if a, if a local majority uh, choose. Yeah. So um, that that's where I see the. the kind I think of that's a critical point, and, and Michael, I'll give you a little pushback here. I think your critical point is actually an outgrowth of the master-slave relationship because, at its very essence, the master-slave relationship denies human inequality, and what we often lose sight of is that denial of of equality was a denial of equality amongst all white men. And so uh, we see a deep distrust of democracy. And you've already pointed out that there is at least a, a willingness uh, to see that men who own property, that they can be responsible and part of the electorate. But there's also a fair openness, which I think would be surprising to a lot of folks, in which, you know, not all white men are created equal. And so that suspicion or fear of majority rule is exactly what you said. It's it's one, it could be potentially be obviously a threat to their power, to their ownership of slaves. And I think you point out that Stephen Douglas in 1860 uh, had some support. I don't know if it was especially strong, but support amongst mechanics and others who uh, were not landowners and would, have, of course, would have probably no intention or desire to become some. So I think that... Um, I think what you've pointed out here again is how the ideology of the slaveholding class cannot just be reduced to race alone, although that certainly is the cement, and there is no denying that there's widespread agreement 
that African Americans, because of their skin color, are deserving of being enslaved. But there's something more at work here, and that is when you deny human equality in the master slave relationship, you have to take that step. And I think Stephanie McCurry's book, um, I think her first book uh, on South Carolina. Oh, Pete's internet's getting screwy. Okay. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Uh, what's Stephanie McCurry's first book again? Masters of Small Worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Masters of Small Worlds. It's a, it's an outstanding book, and uh, and I think that again your findings are fit into that. If we don't have a question from the audience, I'd like to give Michael one last question. How oh, are we go, doing? Ahead. go ahead. So, I found that this portrait of Douglas and Davis, you are. What every good biographer should do is that you are certainly critical. And at the same time, you situate these men within their worlds. You show that within their, their worlds, that there was a certain idealism that they both had, even though we might find their idealism uh, to be reprehensible. But again, you recognize, as I think any good historian should recognize, that that kind of moral chest beating doesn't really get us much in, uh, in, in, anywhere in terms of understanding of the past. And then you get to Douglas, and he fascinates me. You've changed my mind about Douglas, who is a guy that I just sort of wrote off as a political animal who only cared about satisfying his own ambitions. And he certainly was ambitious, there's no doubt about that. But my God, here's a guy that says, popular sovereignty, I let the people decide. What a, man, that's a powerful message. That's going to resonate, right? And it did with a lot of Northern Democrats. But then you say, it's kind of hopelessly idealistic to the point of being truly dangerous when implemented in the territories. What did Douglas not see? He's a smart dude. What did he blow? What did he miss? Because we always say today, power to the people. Let them decide what went wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, this is a good question. And I I am still not sure <laughs> what happened with Douglas on this. Um, I mean, I you know, he's famous for saying, okay, th this issue of slavery expansion is too hot of an issue to deal with in Congress, right? So let's just kick it out um, to the territories and let them decide. And what happens? Well, in Kansas, they start murdering each other uh, over the issue. Um, and so why he thought an issue that Congress couldn't handle would necessarily be handled in a um, peaceful or logical way uh, in the territories is is difficult to understand. Um, that is especially true because in his home state of Illinois, folks had been murdering each other over slavery while he lived there in the 1830s. Um, he, you know, he's not that far away when Elijah Lovejoy, the abolitionist editor, is killed uh, in Alton, Illinois in 1837. Douglas is just up the road. So understanding that, I, I think, is tricky. What I think, if, if you look at Douglas and his views of popular sovereignty, he gets drawn into it over time, and it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger part of his thinking. Initially, he embraces this really to help his party win, uh, which they didn't, but to try to win the presidential election in 1848. Um, so it's a kind of a pragmatic kind of, kind of response. This will help to patch things over. But then it becomes more and more ingrained in his thinking, and he digs in on it more and more until by 1859, he's writing articles saying that popular sovereignty is really what the American Revolution is all about, that it actually predates the Constitution um, and is really this sort of foundational principle uh, of, of the whole country. And so in some sense, he, he, he gets sort of trapped by the idea, I think, and he, he, just, he just holds on to it with, with both hands um, and really decides, I'm going to rise or fall um, with this idea uh, as, as mine. You pointed out some things about the territories in terms of what the settlers, uh, what they could do, who appointed the leaders. Could you go over there? That's, I, I, again, I can't believe I didn't know any of this. So what happens in the territories and why? how did it make popular sovereignty in terms of playing out in real time <laughs> so much more difficult than what anyone could have imagined? Well, what it, what it does is it puts a big um, sort of uh, target on the very first uh, election to choose territorial legislators, because the assumption is once they create a kind of fundamental set of laws for a territory, the fate of slavery will be pretty well decided. 
at that point. And so in Kansas, that first territorial uh, legislative election uh, becomes notoriously fraudulent um, and, and at times violent. Um, and, and so, I mean, that, that's really the disaster. I mean, you could, you could point to Nebraska territory and say, hey, it worked pretty well there, right? Um, you, don't, you don't see uh, similar levels of, uh, of, of violence and then voter intimidation and all these kinds of things there. Um, but certainly in Kansas, it sort of invites people to race to the territory, to uh, try to prevent the opposition from voting, um, to vote illegally, to kill people when they're not going to vote the way that you want. So it, um, it, it raises the stakes at a very particular moment in the history of, of, of self-government in these territories, or particularly in Kansas. Uh, and, and with an issue like slavery, they're not, people have to be willing to lose, right, for democratic uh, decision-making to work. And if they're not, then you're going to have problems. Yeah. And the settlers, and maybe this isn't an apt comparison, are they, uh, in a sense, like the residents of the District of Columbia? I mean, they don't have, well, just tell us, can they, what's their relationship to the federal government in terms of their voting rights and who they can vote for? Yeah, this is something that's fascinating and I think has been underappreciated. Um, so if, if you move to a territory, let's say you could vote in your home state, you move to a territory, you lose the ability to have voting representation in Congress. Territories have non-voting delegates to Congress, but they can speak, but they can't, they can't vote. Um, and you lose the ability to participate in presidential elections too. And Douglas was keenly aware of that. And I, I see one aspect of his career is trying to be a kind of senatorial spokesman for the territories as a group for the for the west as he would understand it um, because they don't have uh, you know literal uh, representation and people write to him they write to him from minnesota territory from oregon territory from nebraska territory and they say i don't really have anybody else to turn to but I think you are on our side, so will you, you know, support this piece of legislation or speak on this issue? And he becomes a kind of unofficial spokesman. And I think that's really important. You know, I mean, we think about, you know, manifest destiny and spreading self-government across the continent and, and all these things. But yet if you move to Oregon Territory in 1850, suddenly you are deprived of meaningful participation in, in federal politics. I thought those were some really important insights in your book. I, I certainly had not thought or encountered that uh, before as well. Hmm. All right, Michael, my last question. And then, uh, you know, we so appreciated you being here. Some, uh, someone says to you, you know what? America's never been more divided than we are today. What do you say to folks who have that observation, who make that observation? I think if, I think if they read... Uh, my book, they will see uh, maybe some recognizable things, but also some sharper divisions. Um, I mean, I, I think there, we certainly have, you know, regionalism hasn't gone out of politics uh, today, but I think, I think in most states you see a pretty stark urban rural divide. Um, and that's a different kind of geographical division than what you see in the antebellum period where the lines are pretty clear or becoming more clearly drawn um, in both partisan and then a, a regional kind of kind of division. And um, the population was also much younger then um, and um, much more, I think, um, maybe more idealistic. There's a certain uh, naivete to antebellum Americans sometimes um, that I think we've we've lost. Um, and maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I mean, I, Jason Phillips has, has written some really good things about this, about their, their belief that, 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 you know, the sort of violent moment will just sort of purge everything that's, that's bad and, and they'll just win and then everything will be great. Uh, and, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we have that, that kind of faith. So, uh, Michael, sometimes I think that Americans today still have that idealism but it's an idealism that's not well grounded in an understanding of the nature of democracy. They sort of see our system as being a pure form of republicanism. And of course, a, a short history on American history or on American politics, I think would remind us all that democracy is often in the gutter, but it does come out every once in a while. It gets itself clean and it's a beautiful thing when that happens. Uh, but I think if we as a people had a more realistic expectation 
of what democracies can do, the rough and tumble nature of them, the partisanship. And as again, you show so brilliantly in this book that constituents matter. <laughs> These guys are responding to the people, right? And so uh, I'm not one of those people who cheerily go out and vote. You know, I, I suspect that people already have that. I hope they have that impulse in them enough that they want to go out and, and read and think about these things in a serious way. Uh, because history tells us leaders respond to the people for better or for worse. That's what, uh, you know, that's what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, again, it, it's so good to see you. A massive congratulations in your position at the University of Tennessee. I'm sorry we did not have time to talk about your editorship of the Andrew Jackson papers. I know you will thrive uh, doing that as well. And uh, again, it's a joy to have you on the show. I'm looking so forward to congratulating you in person. I don't know when that's going to be, uh, but if it's at the Southern Historical Conference in the fall, I hope uh, we'll be able to get a drink and celebrate because it is a well-deserved, well-deserved uh, position that you have. And, and again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Here's a book again, Arguing Until Doomsday. And there's your 40% discount from UNC Press. Mm -hmm. It's also in the description as well as a link. I pinned a link in the comment section to the book, and there's also a link in the description to the event. You guys can't say you didn't see it. <laughs> it's everywhere. And this is, John, you can yeah. tell everyone, for, this is for Thursday. This is for Thursday. Joseph P. Reedy, Illusions of Emancipation. He'll be with us on Thursday at 7 p.m. That's going to be a very interesting discussion. That was a fantastic book as well. So we're really looking forward to having him on Thursday evening. Winner of the Bancroft Prize, I should add as well. Ah, that's right. award. Yes, indeed. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in with your comments. Uh, thank you, Michael, again, for, for joining us this evening. It really means a lot to us. Thank you, Pete, as always. Mm -hmm. And we will see you on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock with Joseph Reedy. Right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye.